Hi, this is Sal Caraprice, providing you with economic and financial reporting. It is Monday, August 14th, and I'm going to provide to you today with a mid-August economic report for 2017. So I'm going to begin today with long-term macroeconomic trends that are occurring, have been occurring, will continue to occur in our economy. And then I'm going to transition over to short term to medium term trends and the outlook on our economy. And then I'm going to um, get into a little bit more detailed economic report. So let's start off. I'm going to begin with uh, jobs in U.S. manufacturing. So jobs in U.S. manufacturing have decreased in a massive way compared to where they were 40 years ago when we experienced peak manufacturing employment in 1977. In 1953, manufacturing accounted for 26% of the U.S. economy as a percentage of GDP, whereas in 2016, it accounts for just over 12%. The primary reasons for this are as a result of outsourcing and increased competitiveness in the global economy. During this period, the U.S. economy has transitioned from a strong manufacturing slash agriculturally based economy into a largely service based economy. Service based jobs, on average, pay half of the wages of the average manufacturing job. Over the past half century, the U.S. economy has faded away from being a production slash manufacturing economy and moved largely towards being a service economy. The Department of Commerce and BLS now attribute nearly 80% of the U.S. economy, the U.S. employment in the economy, to be based in the service sector. That's 80% compared to a much, much smaller number half a century ago. Production economies based in manufacturing, industry, and the general production of real goods are more favorable than service economies because they provide higher paying jobs and add more to the wealth of an economy. Services are difficult to export. Real goods are easy to export. Exports are vital to trade, vital to a trade surplus, and a trade surplus is vital to the financial health of an economy. Therefore, transitioning towards a service economy versus a production economy has weakened the U.S. economic posture. The largest generational cohort, the baby boomers, are transitioning from a working age to retirement age. So, while many, what, what many baby boomers are finding is that they don't have enough money for retirement and so they decide to either continue working in their industry or to find part-time jobs to supplement their income. And what this does is it crowds out the workspace for both low-wage and high-wage jobs. Concerning high-wage positions, boomers are more qualified than other generations as a result of their experience, so they generally receive the first grab at high wage jobs if they are willing to accept the going rate of pay. As for low wage jobs, well, competitiveness is competitiveness. There's just going to be more competition for low wage jobs. Throughout history, all fiat currencies devalue over time, so this trend. I want to make a note of because the average lifespan of a currency is 27 years. So the US dollar has actually gone through a couple different variations of, uh, of, its, of its being, of its use. It's, I believe it's gone through two different resets. Um, so even though it's been continued to be called the US dollar, has actually failed. Uh, more than two times. The next trend I want to talk about is real wages. Uh, so, real wages. Uh, a typical family in the 50s with one parent working 
was enough to support the entire family, a typical nuclear family, a wife, husband, two kids. It was enough to support the entire family, own a home, and have a car. Nowadays, both parents have to work. Both parents have to work in order to support the same level of wealth. Americans have been squeezed from every angle. These angles being price inflation, tax inflation, reduction of benefit inclusion, wage deflation, and the erosion of good paying jobs. Okay, the, the last long term macroeconomic trend I want to talk about is advances in technology. And I think this is pretty important because we're going to see an increase in this, an exponential increase in this, uh, as trends allude to. So, uh, advances in technology such as automation and robotics have largely annexed the worker out of the workforce instead of netting more jobs. This trend is expected to continue with the growth of self-driving vehicles, robot attendants, drones, etc. So in general, technology comes in, makes things more efficient, and reduces the need for human capital, human labor, reduces the need for workers. And that's just the trend of technology that we're going to have to work with. Because it's not going anywhere. It's going to grow and increase. Okay, so on to the short-term, medium-term uh, outlook and short-term, medium-term uh, economic trends in the U.S. economy. Uh, at the moment, financial regulation is looser than ever. Um, concerning a number of different things, primarily auto loans. Um, so regarding auto loans, uh, loan terms have been allowed to stretch to seven years. Um, which is a few years past what we call the collateral life of a vehicle. So when you make a loan, uh, when, you when you have an auto loan, it's, you're collateralizing the loan with the real asset of the vehicle. There's a real asset underlying the loan itself. Uh, same with a mortgage. Uh, when you receive a loan for a house, you are relating you are putting the real asset of the actual real estate the home the house itself as the collateral for the loan so if you decide to stop making payments on this loan then they come and repossess your vehicle or they foreclose you out of your home okay so what that collateral does is it adds uh, reduces risk adds stability to the investment um, so uh, what's happened in the auto loan industry, uh, in the auto industry, is they have stretched out the term of the loan to seven years, sometimes even further than that. Um, as we're typically in the past, uh, it'd be four or five years. Um, so loan term stretching, income verification is becoming minimal to non-existent um, and Additionally, negative equity has been allowed to be wrapped into new loans. Uh, basically, this creates a recipe for defaults. This is just risky lending all around. Uh, I know this because I worked in the auto industry for a while, and uh, what I saw was pretty shocking, and what's happening is, is quite shocking. So, in the end, this is not going to end well. Okay, on to the next. An HSBC report found that home ownership of U.S. millennials ranked among the lowest compared to competing nations with 70% of millennials owning a home in China, 46% in Mexico, 41% in France, and a lowly 35% in the United States. This is just millennials now. So we can see that in China, the millennials are doing much better. In Mexico, they're doing a fair amount better. In France, they're doing better. But in the United States, they're doing not so well. So, uh, in the US, we find a higher percentage of young adults living at home than in many 
prior years as a result of increased indebtedness and difficulty finding good paying jobs, uh, proving that the economy, the economic quality and opportunity has vastly deteriorated over the past century. Okay, next trend. Job market weakness, what I call the overqualification rotation. So higher quality, high quality, high paying jobs have been increasingly axed as a result of outsourcing and corporate layoffs, forcing many unemployed and underemployed to take up low quality jobs that pay less, and some, in some cases, multiple part-time jobs, just to make up for the one good full-time job that used to pay them enough. So earnings growth has been stagnant for nearly a decade, and because of this overqualification rotation, we find folks losing high paying jobs and then having to take on lower paying jobs and uh, sometimes part time which has been a trend that's been associated with Obamacare uh, and, and putting increased tax uh, basically a tax or a penalty for for people for businesses and and individuals alike that uh, don't have auto that don't have health insurance if they're working over 33 and a half hours a week. So the trend that businesses have uh, succeeded to is to make their employees part-time instead of full-time so that they can get around this and it has not been positive for the economy. Okay, next trend, retail sales. Retail sales are a disaster, they're very bleak. Um, the iconic brick and mortars have been reducing their store their brick and mortar storefronts, uh, they've been closing. Some have been just completely going bankrupt and out of business faster than ever before. So that's uh, it's a very notable trend that is uh, damaging, very damaging to our economy. Okay, next. Consumers are overburdened with debt. Auto debt, student loan debt, credit debt, and mortgage debt are at higher levels than ever before. This is a fact. It's not a good one. The 2008 crisis uh, was supposed to fix things, and, and instead what we find now, here in 2017, is that uh, things have gotten worse. Granted, the, I would say the housing, uh, the housing area is improved slightly because of, uh, because of what's happened with the more, uh, with Fanny, Fanny, uh, May and Freddie Mac coming in, uh, basically the government coming in and, and buying up all of the toxic assets um, regarding real estate, um, which is not really a positive thing. Um, and so uh, let's just take real estate out of the equation. Um, even though it's got problems, we'll take it out of the equation. Auto debt, student loan debt, credit debt, higher than ever before. And uh, it's going to be very damaging if we get into a recession. It's going to be very damaging if we experience a normalization of interest rates, if we experience an increase in interest rates. It's going to be very tough for folks with this debt to continue to pay it. And we will see res defaults as a result. So uh, that's, that's something that we should keep our eye on. Um, because those things, a recession, it's bound to happen. Higher interest rates. You know, it's going to happen. At some point, it has to happen. It's it's unavoidable. We can carry the charade on for a little while, but eventually the, those things have to happen. Okay, next. Uh, bubbles. Bubbles are present in every asset class, including debt. So um, we're talking about inflation. We're talking about um, price inflation of assets, price inflation of debt, just all around. Uh, not necessarily price inflation of debt, but uh, the inflation of the debt as a result of taking on more debt. Everywhere you look, you find higher levels of debt, higher levels of price. Um, real estate, we'll get into a little bit later. Real estate is come back up to levels that we saw pre-crisis 2008. Um, and I don't think that they have a fundamental basis uh, to be that high. There's just 
no reason for them to be where they are. Um, just as there's no reason for the stock market to be as high as it is. Uh, the, the, the price to earnings ratios are irrationally high, which is the next point here, the next trend. Uh, but the overall theme here is that we have bubbles now in, in every asset class. Uh, so uh, I guess the one one exception to that would be commodities, uh, which we'll get into later. But uh, bonds, equities, uh, debt of all sorts, they are all in bubbles. Okay. Uh, the freight index. The freight index has yet to return to pre-recession highs. This to me is an indication that our economy is not even as strong as it was uh, back then. Uh, it's just not strong in general and we're experiencing very slow growth. Next and last trend here for the short to medium term is that derivatives use and holdings are at a level so high that it's endangered not just the US economy but also the US currency itself. Um, and this doesn't apply just to the U.S. This applies to all around the world. Uh, but I'm going to focus a little bit more on the U.S. because that's where I live. And that's where I'm going to be reporting more on. That's what I know the most. Okay. Now we'll move on to major geopolitical world events and trends. Uh, the most recent and notable trend in this arena are, is, uh, are the sanctions that were placed on Russia, Iran, and North Korea, most notably, um, on August 2nd. Uh, so Congress got together and passed this in an overwhelming majority. I couldn't even believe the numbers they had behind this. Is, it was veto-proof, so there's nothing that Trump could have done to stop this. I mean, he basically had a choice. He can either play along or he could veto it which I think he probably would have preferred to do, but at, at a certain point he has to create less enemies and considering that the outcome would have been the same anyway, I don't think it really hurt. It, it didn't hurt him by not vetoing it. So Congress has just gone out of control. This deep state that people talk about that's really running the show has gone out of control. They're, they're pushing for war in any way that they can. So what's happened here is uh, these sanctions create a trade war and they push the US into isolation further and further by way of world trade foreign countries are increasingly desiring to do business outside of the dollar this is a trend that's been going on for quite some time now and this really was just a nice little nail in the coffin for the US dollar uh, a big one a real big one so um, once an initial break from the dollar is made for trade payments um, with a major trade partner apart from China I'm going to say um, expect other countries to follow suit causing a detrimental effect to the dollar in the US economy uh, these sanctions in itself, they violate international law and they're creating discord in many spheres of influence. Now, when I began writing this report, the sanctions were just signed and put into law and I'm going on to write about, oh, well, what, what are going to be the effects here? I'm sure that you're going to see some type of retaliation and what we've seen is, is we're on the brink of war with North Korea, which it's hard to predict that kind of thing, but it's pretty easy to see that North Korea has gone out of control. They've been out of control for a little while. And I think the deep state is really just trying to push a war to maybe gloss over, uh, maybe throw up a curtain to what's really going on, uh, try to create a false flag, if not a real flag. I mean, war is war, it's real. You can't say it's a false flag, but they, they do these things just like 9-11 was, was all conceived and predestined uh, by our own people, which is all pretty screwed up. So uh, what I think we see going on here is, is that they're trying to spark a war to try to salvage 
the dollar in some way, salvage our economy. It's, it's part of our military industrial complex has gone on since the end of World War II when it had uh, been built up pretty well as a result of the previous world wars. And uh, so that, that trend has been carrying on in the United States. I'm not really a big supporter of it at all, but it is what it is, and hopefully it comes to an end soon. Well, that end is probably going to be very damaging to citizens of the United States, but I don't really see too many other ways out of it. Okay, so uh, let's let's get a little bit further into these sanctions. Not too far, but let's let's go a little bit deeper. Um, they target anybody. They target these countries: Russia, Iran, North Korea, and anybody that does business with them is also a target. So, what we know is that um, Russia has vast reserves of natural gas. And they have been exporting their natural gas in any way possible. And they do this through a variety of different pipelines. Um, notably the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, which is under construction. Um, basically, uh, the Nord Stream 2 is just... Uh, the attempt to increase the supply of natural gas. Now that goes from uh, the western end of Russia through the sea. It's run underground, or run under the water, um, and then enters into Germany and provides natural gas to uh, Germany as well as uh, the rest of Europe. And Europe wants this natural gas because they want clean energy, natural gas is fairly clean energy, uh, and Russia is the cheapest supplier of it, very simply put, and so that's why uh, they would like Russian natural gas. So what the sanctions do is they prevent Germany and others from conducting business directly with Russia, and uh, the sanctions, they also box Trump's ability to be effective in his part foreign policy actions. Uh, there's some some bull crap in these sanctions, basically. Um, some added points that, that really have no relevance to uh, the main points of the of the sanctions. They're, they're just really an attack on Trump, basically boxing him out from being effective in his foreign policy actions. Um, not, not cool. Uh, it's just power grab from the deep state, power grab from Congress, the way I see it. Um, so, considering that Germany and others were not consulted prior to the passage of this legislation, a new wave of disgust has formed towards American foreign policy. Uh, expect foreign countries around the world to further isolate or ignore the U.S. Um, or retaliate like North Korea, like you see with North Korea, react in some way. Um, they might just say, oh, we'll forget about it. We're going to ignore these sanctions. We'll, we'll do trade. It doesn't have to be in the dollar. Even though you're the world reserve currency, forget about it. We'll do trade in another currency and, well, forget you, U.S. I mean, of course, they can, uh, as a result of many countries around the world having these large holdings of dollars, they can seize assets, they can freeze assets, they can do a lot of different things that are very damaging to anybody with U.S. holdings, with, with dollar holdings. Uh, but we'll see what happens in the future. As far as uh, Germany goes, we'll see what happens with North Korea. Uh, it's not cool. Not cool. I, I think I'm a supporter of free trade. And uh, Trump also more of a supporter of free trade, of course. He has a bias to the U.S., and I would say I have a small or moderate, I'd say I have a moderate bias to the U.S., but in general, I think free trade is a good thing. Um, but Trump has been limited in his ability now to make good on his promises, and that's going to be damaging. Okay, so trade moves east. This is the next thing that I want to talk about here. Trade moves east. 
what does that mean? Uh, so, Germany, Syria, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Russia, China, and others uh, in the regions, they are forming what I would consider New World Alliances. And they are forming new ways of trade. Uh, you know, these things have been around for many years with China and uh, the Silk Road. Thousands of years, these trade routes have been there, but uh, this this goes beyond that. This this goes beyond uh, what what has been before. Uh, I think as a result of the United States really trying its imperialistic measure of controlling everything and doing it through the United States dollar as the world reserve currency, that, that really is a huge, that's a huge reward, that's a huge weight, that's a huge weight, uh, and it carries a lot of power. So I, I don't think the United States dollar, I don't think the US dollar is going to carry this title for much longer with the way things are going because the East is picking up strength. The East is taking on new power. So uh, what you what you find with these uh, new with these countries that I mentioned: Germany, Syria, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Russia, and China. Um, they are doing trade amongst themselves, and they are trying to do it outside of the dollar. Iran has explicitly stated that it doesn't want to do any trade in the dollar wants to do trade in euros because it feared the US pulling some kind of stunt like they did uh, with these sanctions so the sanctions were lifted under Obama and now they're back again so this is the type of thing that Iran did not want the type of thing that Iran feared and that's why they want to do trade for its oil in euros so it's not just Iran that wants to do trade outside of the dollar. It's, it's all these countries, and, and it's because of the way that the United States has bullied other countries around the world. I mean, you have Libya. You have Libya is, is a complete, completely. Well, we failed the state. We we took over. We we well, we didn't take over. We we went in, and uh, we went after Gaddafi. For a variety of different reasons, I want to, don't want to get into it too much. Here, I digress. Okay, so these new world alliances, what they have in common is a a need and a want uh, for natural gas and oil pipeline expansions. Um, so we have Russia. Is, is expanding their their pipelines. Um, Iran and Syria expanding their pipelines. Um, Turkey expanding pipelines. Everybody's uh, in one way or another trying to expand their pipelines. Now you'll notice that Saudi Arabia is not mentioned in this trade moves east bit, but I, I, I should because they're another party participant that wants to move away from the dollar after the 9-11 bill was uh, this 9-11 Saudi bill that allowed US citizens to sue Saudi Arabia and, and receive money for damages essentially uh, that, that was very that was a big threat uh, it, was, it was an attack it was an attack on Saudi Arabia and they did not take kindly to it. So what we have here is uh, the petrodollar is continuing its downtrend. Now the petrodollar was an agreement signed uh, in 19... after the fall of Bretton Woods, which was the link of the US dollar to gold. Uh, 1971, I believe, under Nixon, and 1973, I believe, is when the petrodollar agreement was first initiated with the US and Saudi Arabia. Um, so. Bretton Woods abolished U.S. dollar free floats as fiat currency for two years, and then we pick up oil to back the currency. Now, this is not our own oil, so I mean the whole idea is garbage. 
well, this is what happened. Um, so we, we went from having gold backing our currency to having oil backing our currency. And now it's just a complete cluster because the relationship between the US and Saudi Arabia has been deteriorated. So uh, Saudi Arabia wants to move away from the dollar. They threatened to sell their US Treasury holdings in response to 9-11 Saudi bill, which was a direct attack on the Saudis. It appears the next step in the regression of U.S.-Saudi relations would be accepting non-dollar payments for oil, just like Iran. Uh, if this were to happen with OPEC's largest producer of oil, Saudi Arabia, expect other countries to follow suit, causing the dollar to begin losing its reserve currency status. So it's going to be like dominoes. Once a couple of major parties begin doing this, Saudi Arabia, let's say, begins accepting renminbi for their oil from China. This is going to be a domino effect and countries all around the world that are just disgusted with the US and the dollar and, and what's been going on with it, all this printing of money, devaluation of the currency, which whether realized or not is going to happen one way or another, they don't want to hold it anymore. It's risky for them to hold these assets. It's risky for them to hold treasuries now, so they want to get out of it. That's, that's the plain and simple of it. Um, and that's just their holdings, let alone trade, you know, trade, trade is different from holdings and world currency. The, the reserve currency is, is what most trade is done in, I think something like 75 or 80% of world trade is done in the reserve currency, which is currently the US dollar. So once a couple of major parties go, expect them, the rest to fall like dominoes and that's going to be the end of the dollar. It's going to be very dam damaging to the dollar. It's going to be very damaging to our economy and it's going to be years, maybe a decade or longer before we experience a recovery from that event, which is bound to happen eventually, I believe. Okay, next point. Many banks underlying the euro are destructing. What we call the pigs banks, which are Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. These banks have insolvency issues and require help to stay operational. Italy is upon a third round of defaults and is forced to initiate selective bail-in provisions, indicating how insolvent many banks in the system are. Now, I mention these pigs banks, I mention the European banks because they seem to be the worst of most banks around the world now. All banks, almost, I'm not going to say all, all, most, most of the banks around the world have issues including the U.S. banks, as a result of their derivative exposure. But I mentioned the, pig, the pigs' banks here because they're already through or in or about to be in default. I mentioned Italy, third round of default. It's beginning the selective bail-in provisions. What is that? That means that depositors are at risk if the bank defaults. Depositors will lose their money if the bank defaults. The bank will take the depositors' money if the bank defaults. And this has been written into the contracts, some of the fine contracts that you probably didn't read when you opened your accounts. Um, I can get a little bit further into that, but I'm going to hold off on that for now. Uh, I just want to make the note that these banks are in, in rough shape. Uh, Greece is, is just totally destroyed and there's no recovery in sight for them, unfortunately. It's a shame because it's a beautiful country. Um, but there, there's really no recovery for them. Italy's very close to being in a similar position, although Italy has, has differing, a differing background, has a differing economy. I think if Italy were to break apart from the euro and go either back to the lira or, you know, set up some new currency, I think, go through a reset, I think that they would have hope for restabilizing their economy and, and actually experiencing growth again. Um, Portugal, Spain. They're both in rough shape. Um, the rest of Europe, 
rough shape. Germany, even Germany's in rough shape. Uh, Germany's the strength of all of Europe, and it has problems. Deutsche Bank has problems. So all the banks are having problems. All of fiat has problems. And that's really the underlying cause here is fiat, and and what's occurred as a result. What's what's been allowed to occur as a result of fiat. It, and that's what's really going to cause about the destruction of the system. Okay, next. LIBOR is going out of business. There's going to be a phase out of LIBOR by 2021. Um, I'll get a little bit further into that later on. Um, GDP. All right, so now we're going to get into some of the nitty gritty uh, of the economy. So. GDP growth for 2017 and this is the United States GDP growth 2017 was 2.6% in quarter 2 and 1.2% in quarter 1 1.2% 1. is very low it's you know barely growing um, the average annual rate for 2017 is now at 1.9% and our GDP has reached 18.56 trillion annually in the United States. Quarter two at 2.6 percent makes up for the abysmal first quarter of the year, providing a bright spot for the economy, but the average is still lower than our average growth rate over the past 50 years, which is 3.2 percent average GDP growth. We haven't even come close to hitting 3.2 percent for many years now, so you can see that our economy is not where it should be, it's not growing at an average rate. It's barely growing. We're in one of the slowest recovery periods of US history. GDP growth on the five year average from where we are right now, 2017, August, is 2.04% compared to that 3.2% average growth number over the past 50 years. It doesn't sound like a healthy economy to me. Okay. Um, then real quickly, I'll cite 2017, 2016, 2015, and 2014, 2013 growth rates, which are 1.9%, 1.6%, 2.6%, 2.4%, and 1.7% annually, respectively, to those dates. And the source for that information was the World Bank. Okay, world trade, as measured by exports, continues to fall. 2014, 2015, 2016. Respectively, 19.1 trillion, 16.6 trillion, 16.1 trillion. So, you can see the trend is declining, indicating that world economies are not doing well. Exports is exports are the, the biggest indicator for true growth in an in, in economy. Now, it's not just as simple as that, but if your exports are growing, your economy, I should say, true measure of health. It's the true measure of health for an economy. If your exports are growing, then your economy is going to do well because that means other people are buying your goods. Money is coming into your system, not just a closed loop economy but an open economy where people from the outside countries economies from the outside are coming in to your system to your economy they're giving you money that you didn't have before whatever your profit is is money you didn't have before and what that does is grows your pool of wealth and from wealth can be grown more wealth if you take away from the wealth which are imports then you're going to shrink the wealth and from less wealth less wealth can be grown simple as that okay so world gdp world gdp is off its highs but it recently perked up in 2016 so for 2014 2015 and 2016 we are at respectively 78.9 trillion 74.5 trillion lower 75.5 trillion 
just about a one trillion per cup. So 2016 is better than 2015. Um, but let's take a look at perspective here. When you remove only China from this equation, the remaining world world economies are growing very slowly, if at all. A lot of them are declining. We're in recession. Okay, inflation in 2017 has been soft compared to the Fed's 2.0% target. Overall CPI in July was 1.7%, ticking up from 0.1% from June. Ticking up 0.1% from June. But again, misses the estimates of 1.8. Core CPI was 1.7%, same as in May, same as in June. Food was up 0.2% and energy was down 0.1%. The most notable change for July, placing downward pressure on the core index, was in new vehicle prices, which fell 0.5%. This is the biggest decline since 2009. Okay, economists were expecting a 0.2% uptick in the core and overall indexes, both. Uh, for most of 2016, we were at or above the current Fed target of 2.8%. In direct contrast to 2017, where we see inflation in a downtrend and inflation with a series of misses. So if the Fed can't reach its target, it's not going to be able to accomplish its goals. But we'll talk more about the Fed later. Um, basically, the softness in inflation indicates that the economy is not performing in line with expectations. Okay, next. Across all demographics, U.S. debt is near record highs, while home ownership is near 60-year lows. This paints a scary picture because high debt loads outside of real estate translates into auto debt, credit debt, student loan debt, etc. This type of debt is marginally, if at all, collateralized compared to mortgage debt. So if another 2008 event occurs, or another recession occurs, which at some point an economy goes through a recession. If normal, if interest rates begin to normalize, uh, the damage is going to be much more severe than 2008. Okay, so we know homeownership near 60 year lows, while debt is near record highs. Okay, so that means that all the debt is in debt outside of real estate, like auto debt, credit debt, student loan debt, which this debt is not collateralized. So if there's a default, there's nowhere to rep nothing to repossess. So uh, obviously with an automobile, you can repossess it. But what did I say about automobiles before? Increased term loans, uh, rolling in negative equity, um, so what, the, what does that mean? That means that when you repossess the vehicle, when you expect to get your money back, you're, th there's going to be money that's not there because the loan is going to be, principal is going to be far higher than the value of that collateralized, the value of the collateral. So it's just dangerous. Credit debt, there's, there's nothing. You, what are you going to do with credit debt? There's no collateral for it. Student loan debt, there's no collateral for it. You stop paying, there's nothing to take back. You can't take back a piece of paper. You, you don't, with credit debt, you don't take back the things you bought. It just doesn't work that way. So, uh, if we experience another 2008 event, it's going to be very damaging. It's going to be very damaging. Okay. Let's get on to trade deficit. This is very, very, very important for any economy because this is going to indicate the health of the economy. A deficit or a surplus. Okay. Our current trade deficit is reported at $500 billion. So that means that when you weigh exports versus our imports, we are importing $500 billion more and we're exporting. 
So what that really means is that we're adding $500 billion of debt to keep our country, our economy, and ourselves sustained. Now keep in mind that this figure is during a slow growth economy, slow growth recovery phase. So what will this deficit expand to during a long overdue recession? What will it take to return to a surplus? Without a trade surplus, there is no financial health in the economy. But before we can experience a return to normal growth, which are at levels of between 3 to 4% annually, it's pretty obvious that we need to go through a recession, shed the dead weight, let the weak fail, and let the strong survive. Only then can our economy begin to thrive again. Now, there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that the next time that our economy goes through a recession, that we're going to see destruction like we haven't seen before in the financial system because our fiat currency is probably going to die. The petrodollar is, is going to be wiped away from existence. So the next recession we go through is not going to be a normal recession. It's going to be not even a great recession like in 2008. It's going to be more like the Great Depression of late 1920s. Which that may be worse. So, let's continue. Okay, for our economy to get back to a surplus, I believe we need to be in a 3 to 4% growth economy. So, over the past eight years, what has been revealed to us? That major changes are necessary to get back to average levels of growth. Just average. Not even, not even above average, not even phenomenal. Just to get back to average, 3.2%. That's average growth over the past 50 years. In order to get back to that, major changes are necessary. Okay, what kind of major changes are we talking about? Well, I can get, I can get into it maybe in, in another report, but just, just know it's major changes. And I would say these major changes are going to be with the backbone of sound money, stable money, which we don't have in a fiat system. We need some type of backing. Gold, preferably. We'll see what happens. Okay, this economy, the economy that we've had over the past eight years, has been offered many handicaps, such as never before seen low interest rates and quantitative easing, yet growth is still abnormally low. This points to major problems in our economy that need fixing. Okay, next. On to July, ISM manufacturing. The, PF, the PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index, registered a 56.3 reading versus a 57.8 for June. Any reading above 50 indicates growth. Okay. This index range bound between 49.4 and 58 over the past year has been growing consecutively for 11 months, showing moderate slow growth in manufacturing. The ISM report revealed slowing growth in new orders, production, order backlog, employment, and supplier deliveries. Inventories are flat, but the biggest outlier of the whole report that I found was prices, which are increasing at a faster rate than normal carrying a sizable trend of 17 consecutive months. Now, inflation is not growing at a faster rate than normal. Commodities are not rising at a faster rate than normal. So why are manufacturing prices increasing at a faster rate than normal and a trend that's been continuing for 17 months? The report cited higher raw material costs as the primary factor for the price increase. So I'm putting this together with, okay, we have had a moderate, if not severe decline in the dollar over the same period of time. What happens when you experience a currency devaluation? Well, that puts upward pressure on exports, 
puts pricing pressure on imports and raw material costs that are sourced overseas. It's neutral for raw materials that are sourced domestically. So I think that the dollar decline may be partially responsible for the price increasing that we found here in this report, but I, I think there's a little bit more to this, and I'm going to dig a little bit deeper to see if we can find out more info for the next report. Okay, here's a wowie. July auto sales, bam, dropped 7% overall, industry-wide. Hyundai, GM, Fiat Chrysler had the worst misses, with 27.9% for Hyundai, 15.5% decline for GM, 10.5% decline for Fiat Chrysler. Ford sales declined 7.4%. The only automakers to post gains were Subaru 6.9%, Toyota 3.6%, Audi 2.5%, Porsche 06 That's it. Nobody else posted gains. Everyone else was down. Overall, the annual sales for July dropped to 16.8 million from 17.8 million a year earlier. This is the biggest drop since August 2009. Inventories are building as lot stuffing continues. Okay, so when I say lot stuffing, this is a trend that's been going on in auto sales to try to make the numbers look better. And when I talk about manipulation in that disclaimer video I did, this is one instance of it. They try to do things to make the numbers look better and lot stuffing is one of the ways that they did this what lot stuffing is is a manufacturer delivers vehicles to the dealership that delivered vehicle is counted as a sale that vehicle is not sold it's only sold from the manufacturer to the dealer that's not sold from the dealer to the consumer so I wouldn't consider that vehicle sold. A sold vehicle is a sold vehicle, is a consumer buying a vehicle. That's a sold vehicle. So we have something called lot stuffing that's been occurring. And uh, this is most likely the reason for the inventories building uh, because it's been going on for a while now. And I think it's just getting to the point where you can only do that for so long. Inventories are rising. Uh, I think GM's inventories went up to something like 104 days in their targets at something stupid low like 65 or 70. It's like, wow, okay, you're not even close to your target. What's going on? Lot stuffing. That's what's going on. You're trying to make your sales drops look better than they are or your sales in general look better than they are with other companies. So, uh, Auto sales paint a very bleak picture for the U.S. economy. It's, it's a clear indication that the economy's not doing good. I mean, almost every American has a car, and cars are just one of those things that are easy to get, especially right now. And uh, if car sales are not doing well, the economy's not doing well. Homes used to be, oh, yeah, if you're doing, if we're doing well, you have a home, but that turned into a whole new animal after 2008. Basically what you have going on, what you had going on in 2000, prior to 2008, like 2005, 2006, 2007, with housing, with ninja loans, giving homes out to anybody that had no verification, no job verification, no income verification, just giving them out, propping up a bubble, essentially, in housing. That same thing, loose lending standards, that same thing is occurring in the automobile industry. And so, despite record manufacturer incentives and looser lending standards than ever before, ever before in the automobile industry, vehicle sales are plummeting drastically what does that tell you that's a very bad sign for the economy okay so you put all this together GM is considering cutting six models from being manufactured GM 
went bankrupt once before. Bailed out by the government. Not doing well again. Considering cutting six models from being manufactured. Not good. Not good. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Next. Real quickly, I want to touch upon the Federal Reserve. Because what I want to get into now is the bond, currency, and interest rate section of the report. Um, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet is reported. That could be higher. Likely is higher, but this is a report. It's reported at $4.5 trillion. Of that, $4.5 trillion. $2.5 trillion are in bonds, which is largely as a result of the quantitative quantitative easing that's been going on and another two trillion are mortgage-backed securities which we know are all toxic almost the entire portfolio toxic assets and so when we see housing prices have risen to 2008 levels according to the case Schiller index oh well that's just great but it's just not true uh, there, there's no fundamental backing that. I, I don't think prices should be this high and they're going to drop when when we go into a recession. What those those toxic assets, they, they look so much better when housing prices are higher. And so it just plays into the whole realm of, oh, well, we're going to paint a great picture. The economy is great. Just take a look at Trump. When he was a candidate, oh, we're in a bubble. The economy's not doing well. Uh, now he's a president. Uh, the economy's great. The economy's strong. We're adding all these jobs. Stock market's at record highs. Okay. Just like that. Matter of months. Everything turn changes around? No. No, no. He just, uh, he's getting himself into a corner now. Shouldn't have taken on responsibility. Shouldn't have taken the credit the stock market because he's going to take responsibility for the fall which we all know is going to happen there's no doubt about that okay so at the most recent federal reserve meeting the uh, federal reserve janet yellen she made a complete u-turn from being hawkish to being dovish regarding her policy and regarding interest rates. What we saw earlier this year was interest rate hikes. Uh, now we're experiencing a period of pause for interest rate hikes. Uh, on, the hawkish side, on the hawkish side, they are now publicly admitting that their balance sheet has grown too large and they wish to begin unwinding their $4.5 trillion assets to normal which Jim Rickards considers to be around 2 to 2.5 trillion. Now this could have a large impact on stocks, bonds, and the economy as a whole, but I honestly don't think that they're going to do that. I really don't think that they're going to begin unwinding their balance sheet because it's going to create detrimental effects. All right, so the current impact of the Fed's quantitative easing bond buying program was a large rotation out of bonds, of money out of bonds, and into equities and junk bonds. Investors are chasing yield, which is why you have seen these two markets do so well. Instead of selling their huge treasury holdings in the open market, which would likely spike interest rates uh, and bring about defaults, potentially, potentially cause a recession, uh, they will most likely allow the treasury holdings to mature and then disappear the money when the treasury sends it. Um, so they might do this, they might do this, or they might just continue their pattern, continue with their portfolio when the money comes in, when the interest money comes in, when the bond matures and that money comes in, they might just reinvest it like they've been doing. We'll see. We're going to have to see how this unfolds because we're getting to, we're getting to a precipice here. We're getting to a point where it can only continue for so much longer before something happens pretty major. So, many folks believe the Fed won't be able to tighten to a significant effect without causing major economic damage. I am one of them. Okay. 
onto the US dollar. Let's take a look at the strengthening versus the weakening factors for US dollar. Okay, so strengthening factor. The only major strengthening factor that I see for the US dollar at this point is Trump, the Trump rally, the Trump promises, which at this point are largely unfulfilled and are probably going to remain that way. Healthcare was a bust. Uh, this new sanctions bill puts a lot of pressure on Trump, pretty much boxes him in. They're starting, the, the Congress and the deep state are starting to exert power over Trump and really, I think, limit his ability to do what he said he was going to do. So I expect that trend to continue. Weakening factor. Okay, this is a list now. Rejection of the US dollar for trade payments. Next, years of quantitative easing. Money printing essentially, having an inverted effect on the dollar. Next, trade deficit. Currently between 0.5 to 1.2 trillion dollars a year with increases forecasted. Next, anticipation of quantitative tightening so while the effects of tightening are theoretically positive and strong for the dollar we all know that quantitative easing has been used to prop up the dollar and so unraveling the fed's balance sheet would increase interest rates and be destructive to the dollar due to the large levels of debt that we have in a strong economy currency strength would counterbalance tightening but we see that our economy is far from strong. Okay, and the last point for a weakening factor of the dollar is sanctions, our sanctions that initiate a full-scale trade war. So th this is undergoing as we speak. The sanctions really, really are going to act as a catalyst to this trade war. It's not initiated with certain countries that, that were um, neutral in, in that regard. Okay, so another another thing that we're seeing here, the U.S. interest rate yield curve has begun to flatten since the beginning of the year, if not a little earlier. Okay, so what, what does that mean? It means that short-term treasury rates are rising, and that, ind that indicates a decrease in demand for the short term, while the long-term treasury rates are declining, which indicates an increase in demand for the long term. So investors are rotating from short-term bonds to long-term bonds seeking higher yield. This occurs when bond investors lose faith in the economy and fear a recession coming because during a recession the Fed lowers rates. Resultingly, when investors come to reinvest their short-term bonds, rates will be in a lower recession. Resultingly, when investors come to reinvest their short-term bonds, rates will be lower in a recession. So they instead invest bonds in the long term, hoping to avoid the interest rate risk associated with the recession. So we may reach an inversion in the next year, which is where short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. This occurred um, in 2000 and in 2006 and yield curve inversions are historical historically accurate predictors of recession so if we do experience a, an inversion of the u.s rates you can surely expect a recession to follow something to keep an eye on okay next foreign countries are finding it risky to hold u.s treasury reserves all right proof is in foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries that are being sold off at an increasing rate each month. Most of the rest of the world seems to have realized that the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve has created enormous risk for the currency and will at some point result in a major devaluation of the U.S. dollar. Countries with the largest U.S. Treasury reserves are Japan with 1.11 trillion currently, China with 1.1 trillion, those are the two largest countries. Uh, the rest, according to the report, uh, report of the Treasury, uh, are, are much, much lower. So, something that we also want, want to look into or keep your eye out for 
uh, is Saudi Arabia because it's reported that their treasuries are like 150 billion however some people are saying that Saudi Arabia has potentially up to 3 trillion in treasury holdings and uh, if you do the math of their surplus over the last 40 years now think about Saudi Arabia they formed the petrodollar agreement with the United States um, they do their basically the agreement says stick to the US dollar and it'll be good for everybody um, so think about 40 years of that 40 years of their surplus in the US dollar and treasuries and we come up with a number somewhere around 3 trillion so although it's not reported some folks are saying that Saudi Arabia has 3 trillion in treasury holdings we know that Saudi Arabia wants to get out they want to sell it maybe they have been secretly who knows um, so we'll have to see how this unfolds something to keep your eye out for I'll do a little more research on that as well okay um, China Japan and others have been selling US treasuries over the past few years since 2014 China alone has reduced its US Treasury holdings by nearly half a trillion dollars Saudi Arabia has threatened to sell whatever their holdings are in response to the 9-11 bill that holds the Saudis responsible for damages why aren't interest rates rising with all this debt being sold off well because the Fed's quantitative easing program has been providing the demand and buying up most of the sold off bonds to ensure stability of the dollar considering that tightening is much more difficult than easing the long-term effects of this policy will be very damaging to the US currency okay next I want to talk about the SDR which stands for the special drawing rights so as of October 1st 2016 the Chinese renminbi brings a new rival to the US dollar October 1st 2016 the Chinese renminbi is going to be included in the basket of currencies in the SDR the renminbi now accounts for 11 percent of the SDR basket which now includes five total currencies versus four of this 11 percent that the renminbi makes up the euro gave up the most ground with Japanese yen and the German British pound giving up smaller percentages uh, the US dollar gave up almost no weight and um, I think this is going to change in the future um, as, as we see the trend away from the US dollar continue uh, but as of now the US dollar gave up no ground and the SDR basket is comprised up of 41.73% uh, US dollar 30.93% euro 10.92% Chinese won 8.33% Japanese yen and 8.09% German British pound so I anticipate the US dollars weight to be reduced in the basket in the coming years uh, as the list of factors supporting strength of the US dollar becomes smaller each month okay now part of this is the BRICS nations BRICS nations are Brazil Russia India China and South Africa together they formed a bank they formed an alliance and what they collectively have or on the pathway to is 15 percent voting power in the IMF now 15 percent is a magic number because that's the magic number to reach a veto in the IMF as of now the only member that has 15 percent voting power in the IMF is the United States so because of this the United States gets to rule the roost because of this the United States has been able to maintain its world reserve currency status but we're going to see an upset of this power as these BRICS nations grow looks to me like October 2017 we may see that 15% come in now is the the percentage that you're given is as a result 
of the size of your GDP. So as they grow and they reach that 15% margin, then they are going to reach that veto power. October 2017, they may have that. If they bring about a veto and they want to reform any of the policies that the IMF has in place, for example, the weight of the dollar or its use of the dollar, we could potentially see the loss of the reserve status around that time frame. Maybe it's later, maybe not, maybe it doesn't happen at all. But it's something to keep your eye on. BRICS nations um, overpowering. Now, there's there's really no reason for those countries, especially now with the sanctions uh, coming in place, there's no reason for them to not go against the United States. There's no reason for them to play nice because the United States has not been playing nice with them. So it's really something to keep our eye on. on. Um, okay, next. China is expanding their SWIFT banking system. Okay, so we'll get into this a little bit. Um, I don't get too far into it. Basically, what the SWIFT banking system uh, alternative is, China created a SWIFT banking system alternative called CHIPS, Cross-Border Interbank Payment System. That went live in 2015. Uh, CHIPS has grown in size and use since its inception. Um, as particular, world around, as particular countries around the world are rejected from the SWIFT system as a result of sanctions, namely Iran, North Korea, and Russia, they turn to CHIPS. CHIPS has a long way to go to be considered a rival by size to SWIFT, because SWIFT is just has a very, very large majority over CHIPS, but the roots are already set for the mainstream banking alternative. And, and whether SWIFT is used or whether CHIPS systems are used, um, notable territories are beginning to stray from the dollar. And these territories include the Middle East, Eastern Europe, Russia, and China. Uh, wanting to sell and buy energy in their own currency or RMB. Um, and not just energy, but other goods as well. Converting to the US dollar is beginning to appear as an unnecessary step in their trade process. With the deterioration of just US foreign policy over the past few decades, Countries now feel more emboldened than ever to defy the wishes and demands of the United States to conduct trade using the petrodollar. Sound money alternatives to fiat currency are sparking up in cryptocurrencies. Silver and gold-backed cryptos are initiating ICOs, initial coin offerings. Demand for non-backed cryptos such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum are higher than ever as indicated by their price charts. Bitcoin has risen from a sub $300 coin level throughout most of 2015 to over $4,100 a coin currently. I expect this demand trend to continue as more countries and businesses accept Bitcoin for payment. There was an instance that occurred, uh, the failed French referendum. Marie Le Pen and uh, the party constituent that got in, Macron, uh, he pretty much put the kibosh on France leaving the euro. So what happened as a result of that, uh, that served as a catalyst reversing the short euro trade. And so that pushed the euro higher and ever since then has pushed the dollar and the Swiss franc lower. So I just wanted to make a note of that. In the currency bond section here. Uh, so in today's world of near zero to negative interest rates, central banks around the world have transitioned from being liquidity managers to being investment managers. The proof of this is in their portfolio holdings, which now range from stocks to toxic real estate. Holding these assets substantially increases their risk and this is why risk is increasing their currencies. Such policies are foolish and point to an end of their fiat life cycle, their fiat currencies, uh, which we know is an average of 27 years. So um, I, I really condemn this type of behavior. I, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, quantitative easing. 
taking on assets. Uh, the Swiss bank um, is got a fair portion of their holdings in the U.S. stock market. Uh, it's just kind of crazy. Um, you know that the European Central Bank has done an enormous amount of quantitative easing. Japanese Central Bank, an enormous amount of quantitative easing. And the United States Federal Reserve has done an enormous amount of quantitative easing. So this is just a dangerous path for the currencies, which is going to be destructive in the end. So as a result, we, world fiat currencies are largely on a decline as a result of central bank quantitative easing, increased debt loads, loose lending standards, and slow economic growth. Okay, uh, a little bit into, we'll dive a little bit into the LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Offer Rate. Uh, it's planned to be phased out by 2021. And the primary reason cited by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, is a lack of sufficient transactions to establish a solid number for the benchmark rate. So in other words, there was not enough activity in the LIBOR market to determine its rate with certainty. This is not a good sign for the banking world. I think this is uh, just an indication of what's to come. So the phasing out of LIBOR seems to indicate a larger number, a larger economic problem, being the lack of underlying bank activities to support the LIBOR structure. Um, and then uh, kind of on a more broad note, regarding central banks. Um, as the US Federal Reserve switches gears from quantitative easing, which is money supply expansion, to quantitative tightening, money supply contraction, one must wonder if other central banks around the world will follow suit. Uh, this tightening is expected to begin between September and November of this year. I think if they actually go through with it, and then you have other central banks around the world follow suit, you're going to see an increase in interest rates, and it, I mean, it's got to, it's almost certainly going to spark a recession considering the levels of debt. So, Jim Rickards talks about this quite a lot, and uh, he's got some books on it. Um, it. It's pretty much a certainty at this point that when they go down that pathway, that's what's going to happen. So, we'll have to see if they actually go through with the tightening phase. Okay, on to employment. So we have a couple different metrics, a couple different indicators for employment that I'm going to outline. Um, two of them are BLS derived. The headline is called U3, which um, you may have heard has become manipulated over time. Um, U6 is a little bit more encompassing. And then there's another benchmark indicator that I'm going to use called a uh, from shadow stats it's more all-inclusive so we'll start with the U3 which is the primary headline uh, employment number that we use that most media outlets report on so non-farm payrolls for July 2017 rose 209,000 beating consensus of 178,000 by 31,000 jobs so this was a pretty good number um, it beat consensus by a fair margin, so that's why people were uh, really positive about it. And, uh, and the market investors were, were very positive about this number. Um, so the unemployment rate ticked down to 4.3% with the participation rate picking up to 62.9%. Uh, areas of strength for July were factory payrolls, and professional and non-business services. Okay, so then we move on to the U6. The unemployment rate was unchanged for the U6. It was a little bit more all-encompassing uh, factors in a little bit more that discourage workers, factors in people who've been looking for a job. Uh, for, or I should say, <clears throat> who've been looking for a job but haven't really looked for a job in the past, uh, I think it's over four weeks in the U3, it, they kicked out of the U3. So the U6 is unchanged at 8.6% month over month. Um, so 8.6 is about double, it's exactly double the 4.3% that the U3 is reporting. And then we move on to the shadow stats figure, which is all-inclusive to include just about all 
of the people who want a job that cannot find a job or are not looking for a job but would still take a job if they could find one. And this number is at 22.1%. This feels to me like it's more in line with the it's more accurate predictor benchmark indicator of what's actually going on in our economy. So the macro trend remains that the breadth of jobs are not great. Um, the breadth of jobs has is, is been decreasing, which means that the quality of jobs have declined substantially over the years. And many folks that went from one full-time job, um, many folks went from one full-time job to either one or multiple part-time jobs at lower wages with less benefits. So this is what the breadth is getting at. Uh, that yeah, just just because we have numbers for unemployment that are looking good on the U3, that doesn't mean that the situation is rosier. Wages are not what they used to be. Um, benefits are not what they used to be. Pensions are really not there anymore. So when we take a look at the, the whole picture, we can see that the jobs uh, scenario, the jobs arena has not really improved overall. And just to put this into perspective, the jobs report numbers that we're receiving are nowhere near a very strong growth economy, which Peter Schiff pointed out during a Reagan administration, we had jobs numbers, jobs growth numbers between 700, 800, 900,000, a million jobs added in a month. So I just wanted to put that out there to give you some perspective of what a strong growth economy as far as jobs looks like. Okay, so on to real estate. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into real estate. I don't have too much on it, but I will in the future. Um, Case, the Case Schiller Home Price Index returns to 2008 highs. So I don't think that these price levels are really too justified. We know home ownership is at a near 60 level. 60-year low, uh, and so we know that the Federal Reserve has $2.5 trillion in mortgage-backed securities, which are almost all toxic, if not close to toxic. Um, so when we see home prices return to this level, it makes the Federal Reserve balance sheet look much better. So home price is rising up to this level this time around. Um, who's it benefiting? Uh, most of the people who were in the housing market uh, were shaken out. A lot of people were shaken out um, as a result of the aftermath of 2008. We know that the mortgage-backed securities were the heart of uh, the crisis. The, they were bundling mortgage-backed securities together, wrapping them up in a fund or a bond, um, selling them, selling the derivatives of them, well, selling them as, uh, you know, they were junk, and they were selling them as triple A, um, totally rating them much higher than they were. And um, then they were trading off of them, they were making outrageous bets through derivatives. So when these folks in homes that they couldn't afford began defaulting on their mortgages. This will cause about, this was sparked the financial crisis, 2007-2008. So um, a lot of the people were shaken out. A lot of people lost money in their homes. Their, most home prices dropped 35 to 40%. And so people that bought near the peak were literally losing that much money. Um, now, a lot of them foreclosed, just took the hit. Okay, we're gonna declare bankruptcy, foreclose, let the home be foreclosed upon, and then you get out of some of the debt that you're in, and then you find the government had to pick it up. Somebody had to pick it up because it was real money that was being lost, even though it was all paper for the most part. And that's the way that the system works. So uh, home prices are returning to this to this level, um, primarily aid and help and benefit. Uh, the Federal Reserve, that seems to be the biggest benefiter at the moment of these home prices going up because it makes their 
toxic real estate portfolio um, appear less toxic. So we have home ownership near 60 year lows. What does that mean? It means that more people are renting now than ever. If you're not owning a home, you have to rent a home. It's, you have to live somewhere. So that's put a lot more demand on uh, either mixed use, um, apartment building to put demand for uh, apartments higher, to put demand for um, that type of construction higher. And uh, you can see that in the data. Now, I don't have too much info on that right now. I'll, I'll get into the real estate much more in depth in the next report. Um, I want to focus on, on what I feel are the main things at the, at the moment um, underlying current situation. Real estate at this point is a little bit more insulated to the consumers, to the citizens, because they've already been shaken out after the 2007-2008 crisis. So um, this time around, real estate is not going to be a main detractor, uh, it's not going to be a main effector of a recession. Um, so that's why I'm not going to focus on it too much right now. But an interesting trend to note uh, is that Chinese have been buying foreign real estate um, in a very big way. Um, it said that about 15% of all the commercial real estate in Canada is owned by the Chinese. I don't have the exact figure in the United States, but the Chinese have been buying up huge amounts of commercial real estate in the United States as well. Um, and so it's not just the commercial real estate that the Chinese have been buying. They've actually been buying uh, residential real estate as well. And I think this is part of an overall trend, which is that the Chinese have large amounts of US dollars and they're trying to get rid of them. And I think this is how, this has been one way that they they feel is, is a safe way to get rid of their dollars without directly dumping it onto the market. Uh, so we have the Chinese buying a lot of real estate in Canada, also in the United States. Canada went so far as to make a law that taxed foreign buyers on real estate, uh, particularly targeting the Chinese. Um, I think the tax was 15%. And so what happened as a result is you can see in the Vancouver market, um, Vancouver, Canada, a lot of the Chinese got pushed out as a result of this tax. They said, well, we're gonna lose 15% on the purchase, and we're going to lose 15% of our money just on the tax. Uh, so what they did was they just went right across the border into Washington state. Uh, and you can see a big uptick in the Seattle Metro uh, in, in home prices in the Seattle Metro is up like eight or 10%. Uh, in the last round of the case Schiller uh, home price index report. And, uh, that appears to be the reason why there is such an outlier in the pricing of the Seattle metro area. I believe it's Chinese buyers that are coming in and buying the real estate there um, because they didn't want to take the haircut on the Canadian foreign real estate buyer tax. So interesting to note there. Interesting to note that the Chinese in general are buying a lot of real estate. Uh, not really positive for US nationalistic ideals. So it's something we'll have to keep an eye on. We know the Chinese have a lot of money. Um, the, we know that the Chinese have a lot of US treasuries and it seems to be that they are buying up real estate and they rather own the real estate than, uh, than the whole of the treasuries. So it's quite interesting. Um, perhaps the real estate will be more resilient in its pricing. Um, maybe we won't see a huge deflation of real estate prices um, like we saw in 2008 because now we don't really have the, the same situation where people with in a subprime market are owning homes, people with no jobs owning homes. Now, it's not really the case anymore. A lot of the nastiness has been shaken out, which is what's supposed to happen. Uh, during the recession. So real estate kind of took care of itself. Um, 
sort of the the Federal Reserve coming in with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and and buying up all the toxic real estate it's not really a good thing and we're going to see the effect of that at some point come through um, sort of just been really slow uh, we'll see if they can unwind it if they can get rid of those assets but uh, that's yet to be seen okay on to the next derivatives um, I don't have a huge amount on derivatives, but it's important to note. I'll get more on on deriv derivatives and how they play a role in the economy and, and how they've been affecting us because they've been used in a huge way. Um, derivatives have spiraled out of control in terms of their use. Um, derivatives have no real assets behind them. They're just a spin-off of an asset. Um, you know, we can in some cases have a spin-off of a spin-off of a spin-off it's just a derivative of a derivative of a derivative and it's just it's gone out of control I think um, I think we should maybe bring in some legislation to limit the amount of derivatives that are allowed to be used because it's destructing wealth it's going to destruct wealth in the long run um, so one example of uh, derivatives that are used our interest rate swaps. Um, so, interest rate interest rate swaps have been used to uh, drive stability of certain fiat currencies, notably the dollar and the euro. Um, so, one way they do this is what's called the carry trade. They borrow in cheap currencies. Um, so. Japanese yen, euro, they have negative interest rates. What that means is that when you borrow in that currency, or you're paying to invest, you're receiving money to borrow. So it will borrow in the negative interest rate currency and will invest in the positive currency. So the US dollar, treasuries are still positive. And that's what's called the carry trade. Um, so it's just sort of some uh, currency, foreign exchange, financial tools that are used to generate money. Um, so I'll have more on derivatives in the next financial report. So on the commodities. Commodities are important because they're real, like gold and silver are a safe haven asset. So they almost always tick up during a recession. Oil, well, that's a demand-driven asset. Um, copper, primarily demand-driven, um, very closely connected to construction. Um, so those types of assets during a recession will decrease because demand decreases. Um, so let's get into gold and silver firstly. Gold and silver typically move in tandem with each other. Silver has a tendency to be more volatile and front run by hours or days for gold. Both are safe haven assets that maintain a store of value and are unaffected by inflation in a negative way. Obviously, when inflation occurs, those assets keep up in pace in line with inflation. But their pricing structure is a little bit more complex than inflation alone. Uh, gold and silver have been used as real money for thousands of years, and they've outlived many fiat currencies. Gold and silver both have unique properties, unlike any other metal found on Earth. It's commonly known that gold and silver have been manipulated lower um, for over 100 years, I'd say. Um, and more recently, uh, gold and silver have been manipulated in much more severe ways. Uh, at the moment, the primary method for manipulation is through non-delivery in the paper market, which is the COMEX market. So you can see that thousands of contracts uh, in many cases, thousands of contracts trade per one single ounce of metal that's delivered. And that's just one example of a derivative that's, that's out of control. That because of the derivative being allowed to be used and traded the way that it is, uh, we have a manipulation that's occurred in the gold and silver market. You can take a look uh, at JP Morgan. You can look up JP Morgan's manipulation or alleged manipulation of the silver market, I think it was 2011, um, going the other way. Uh, they had to do a short cover um, 
And it's just a pretty clear-cut example of legitimate manipulation that goes on and said that that was in collusion with the government as well. So I'll get more information on that. That's something that I found to be pretty shocking. Just evidence right there of manipulation. They can manip manipulate one way, they can manipulate another way. And the more I research, the more I find out that the markets can be manipulated and are manipulated in ways that I never dreamed of when I first began learning about economics. So it's important to know these types of things if you're going to be investing because they affect pricing. So uh, at the moment, spot prices of gold and silver, uh, metals in general, are very near to the mining costs. And I believe gold and silver are the most undervalued asset class at the moment. Gold in late 2015 made a five-year low of $1,050. Gold has been slowly rallying since. Gold has been range-bound, forming a solid base between $1,200 to $1,300 an ounce since the beginning of 2016. The next level of resistance to breakthrough is $1,300, and after that, $1,350. Gold is currently very close to breaking above $1,300. It's currently around $1,290. Uh, and I think once gold breaks above, let's say, $1,400, it's going to very quickly run to four, or to $2,000. Um, and probably even further than that. So gold is the most stable form of money in a world of dying currencies. Silver, in late 2015, made a five-year low of $13.80. Silver has been slowly rallying ever since. The most notable investable point for silver is its popularity and need in industrial use due to its unique properties. Uh, silver is used in almost every technology every technology device for this reason silver is expected to outperform gold which is expected to outperform nearly every asset class over the next 10 years additional upward pressure for silver lies in a return to the historical gold and silver ratio which currently the ratio for gold to silver for silver to gold is 75 to 1. So 75 ounces of silver equals 1 ounce of gold. The historical ratio for silver to gold is 16 ounces of silver equates to 1 ounce of gold in terms of its price. So once we get away from the manipulation, we will see, we should see a return to the historical ratio for silver to gold. That alone is going to increase the price of silver by four to five times where it's at now. That's without gold moving a single penny. And we all know that gold can very easily is going to run up, uh, as we saw in uh, 2011 range. 2011, gold ran up to around 1800 maybe a little bit further than that. So it's um, pretty easy to see that these assets can run and run pretty far. Um, another strengthening factor for gold and silver is the COT report, the COT report, Chicago Options Trade Report, which indicates a potential bottom in the metals. Um, as the most recent report indicated that large specs had reversed their position um, and, and were more uh, bearish than they were bullish than in a while and the commercials were more bullish than bearish than they were in a while so it's a, a reversal of their sentiment which has typically been a, uh, a bullish factor another bullish factor for the metals are the fall gold season where demand always increases uh, it's a cyclical it's a, annually every year um, has to do with India and weddings and gold purchases and it's much broader than that, but that's one one element to it. Uh, a bearish factor for these metals is the COMEX manipulation that will probably continue to go on for as long as possible until the, the whole thing just breaks down and they can't do it anymore. 
Um, so it's the only bearish factor that I see for the metals, but it's been a huge factor because it's been able to, that manipulation has been able to keep the metals low, much lower than they should be. Okay, on to energy. Let's touch upon oil. Oil remains under $50 a barrel. Um, I want to talk about OPEC a little bit. We'll get into some natural gas um, in the Middle East and uh, playing with these sanctions. So OPEC's, OPEC is the largest member body of an oil conglomerate. Uh, I believe it makes up over 30 different nations, 20, no, maybe it's 25, 30, somewhere in that range. Um, and so collectively, when they can get along and they get together and everybody agrees on output, they agree on whatever they decide to agree on, then they are very powerful. Um, however, OPEC's influence has been shrinking over time because member countries, if they can't agree on something, they usually wind up breaking their output agreements uh, months after the agreement. So I say as a result of that, that it, OPEC's influence is shrinking. Um, you gotta, you got to understand that each individual country has its own set of problems. So uh, I could just give you one example. Uh, the largest OPEC member, Saudi Arabia. They, Saudi Arabia is in, in a really tough spot. They really have no more friends anymore. They are one half of a faction that is the result of much conflict in the Middle East. And uh, so in order for them to just make their budget, uh, the current output that they have, they need oil to be between 90 to to $100 a barrel just in order to make their budget Otherwise, they're running huge deficits. So, obviously, it's in Saudi Arabia's best interest to pump as much oil as possible in order to try to achieve the surplus, or at least eliminate the deficit, reduce the deficit. But when we put OPEC together, they're going to say, oh, well, we're agreeing to cap you at X amount. So... You can not overproduce. You cannot reduce your deficit. You're going to have your deficit because we're we're coming to an agreement, a collective uh, 30 countries or so through OPEC. And so, individually, Saudi Arabia will want to overproduce in order to help their own financial health. But because of OPEC, they cannot do that. So you can see how. Uh, individually, countries will not want to do what, what an individual country's best interest is, is not usually in line with OPEC as a collective. So for that reason, OPEC's influence is shrinking. Um, as a result of OPEC's influence shrinking, their ability to supply rig and or price manipulate, same thing, is becoming more and more difficult. Um, Iran, with their recent onlining of its supply, um, added an additional 1.9 billion barrels a day of exports onto the market that was uh, allowed to be onlined um, as a result of the nuclear deal under Obama. Um, so <clears throat> now we have new sanctions that say nobody can do business with Iran or Russia or North Korea, but that's not, it's not going to stop countries around this time around. Uh, they're going to find ways to do it, just like what Germany did in the past when we had sanctions against Russia, um, was to create German subsidiaries in Russia, and that's how they got around these sanctions. So there are ways to get around these sanctions um, that are outside of completely ignoring them. Um, so, uh, it, while it does make things more difficult it, for these countries that have sanctions imposed and people that do trade with them, um, it's still not impossible for them to do trade. So, uh, U.S. oil companies, they're in a very tough place. 
they have been fairly effectively shut out of most of the shale oil production, um, which have costs of upwards of $60 a barrel. Now shale really, it pretty much doubled our oil output um, versus the traditional extraction methods. Now we know that traditional extraction costs for the US producers are in the low $40 a barrel range. So that makes their operations profitable at current prices, but um, US oil companies will have to be majority traditional extraction method in order to survive with oil at the price where it's at now, and I don't see price going much higher. I mean, obviously, if the price goes up to 60 and we have a bunch more shale, actually, a lot of the shale is still running. Um, they're just running, they're taking on debt in order to maintain operations, hoping that oil will go up, but I don't see oil going up because we have more and more production going online. So that debt comes due in the coming years. I think it's been a couple of years now where oil's like this. We took on three, four, five year debt. So once that debt comes due, they're either going to have to go out of business or shut down completely. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not going to be pretty for these guys. It's really affected the U.S. producers. So shale this is pretty much being shut out, shut down. Um, so both Iran and Libya plan to raise their production in the coming years. Um, by over a million dollars or a, mo a million barrels per day each. And there are other countries that plan to raise production if it's allowed. Now, Iran and Libya have been uh, set, they have not been forced to follow the OPEC agreement um, just because they have, they've been out of it. They've been out of the game really. Uh, and I think that's why um, they're not forced to follow the OPEC agreement. Uh, that may change in the future, but Iran's been so pushed around. There's really, I mean, if they decide not to follow the OPEC agreement, what's going to happen to them? I don't really see major repercussions. They get pushed around so much with sanctions and other things that it really doesn't affect them. It doesn't really help them to follow agreements. So that's just one one example of more oil that's going to be online in the future years. Um, so all these factors, they put downward pressure on oil for years to come. Um, demand is not really picking up. Things are becoming more efficient. Automobiles becoming more efficient. Um, and we don't see economies expanding at huge rates. Um, so demand is, is just not going up and supply is going to continue to slowly rise. So that's all pretty uh, stable to negative for the price of oil. Natural gas, natural gas pipelines throughout the Middle East and Eastern Europe are developing fairly quickly. Some of these pipelines are already built, such as the Blue Stream and the Nord Stream 1. Other pipelines are in the planning stages or construction stages, such as the Turk Stream and the Nord Stream 2. So the Nord Stream Pipeline is a pipeline that bridges from Russia and bridges Russian gas to Europe through the Baltic Sea and to Germany. So the Turk Stream pipeline, that's planned to supplement the Blue Stream. Um, as the Blue Stream nears its capacity, um, so the Turk Stream is planned to supply additional Russian gas to Turkey through the Black Sea. The Nord Stream 2 pipeline is planning to supply additional Russian gas to Europe through the Baltic Sea into Germany. Uh, many other oil and gas pipelines running from Iran into Iraq and Syria and potentially Europe have been planned, uh, but the conflict and sanctions have continually derailed engagement. Uh, it said one of the major reasons why we were in Syria and why this whole Syrian conflict came to be was because of a division in the factions, the two major factions in the Middle East, the one of the Sunnis, which are ISIS, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the United States. And we have the Shiites, which are Iran, Iraq, Syria, and others. Those are the two major factions. We have Sunni versus the Shiite. So the Sunni alliances, they wanted to run their pipelines 
uh, through Syria and potentially to supply oil and gas to Europe, which would be the real moneymaker for them. And the Shiites, they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to run pipelines through Syria to hopefully supply gas to oil and gas to Europe. So that's where we found Syria became a crux point for this more recent conflict. And, and that's really what's at the heart of this conflict. That's why you find the United States came to invade Syria in an effort to overthrow Assad, knowing that Assad and Syria are primarily Shiite, and the United States is more heavily aligned with the Sunnis. That's why you had uh, Iran come in. That's why you had Russia come in because they all they all have interest in in the oil and gas in that region. And you can just see the factions. And once you put the factions together, it makes all the more sense of why the United States invaded, because the United States is aligned with uh, Saudi Arabia and ISIS, believe it or not, because they funneled money through the United Arab Emirates, and you have Qatar plays a region plays a role in the region. Um, so. We'll get a little bit further into that and in maybe a separate piece, but um, it's just very interesting to see how Middle East conflict is derived. So at this point, we have the Sunni countries um, and their allies that have largely lost power. They've largely lost ground, money, resources in the Middle East and through its conflicts. Uh, at this point, these pipelines that are planned to be, that are some under construction, some are already there. They will enable low-cost producers such as Iran and Iraq and Russia to uh, that have vast energy reserves. They're going to enable them to efficiently deliver low-cost energy to the regions. And the big hope is to Europe. That's going to be the real breadwinner for them. They can get these pipelines successfully all the way through to Europe and connect them. That'll be great for Europe, of course, it's going to be against our sanctions, right? But it's going to come to a point where they just don't care anymore. The U.S. is losing power and influence and, and the rest of the world is tired of being bullied by them. And uh, so you can see when we connect all these dots, how the U.S., because of all these things, will lose power and influence, will lose its reserve currency. They just, they're just losing it. It's just a natural, it's part of the natural theme of events that's occurring. And that when all else fails, the United States goes to war. Well, can't go to war forever. And uh, we've pretty much lost their, our effort at war. Um, so Syria was, was pretty important. Um, pretty, pretty big loss and just another nail in, in the dollar coffin. So... That's what's going on with uh, the Middle East and with sanctions. That, that's part of you know, the, the main reason why conflict is rising and always has been in the Middle East. Um, so lastly, we're going to go on to equities. I don't have a huge amount on equities. I'll expand more on this in, in future reports, but I just want to do a little summary of equities and explain what's going on. So equities continue to climb to exorbitant levels. Now, see that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is over 22,000, which is just irrationally high when you take a look at the fundamentals driving this market. And when you take a look at the price and earnings ratios, they're just exorbitantly high. They're higher than they've been in a long, long time. You see, the last time when they were at these levels was prior to the dot-com bubble. Um, I think you might have seen them. I think you might have seen a real peak in price earnings ratios before the uh, stock market crash of 27. So when we get to these levels, what happens? You see a big crash. It's just inevitable. I mean, there's going to come a point when people realize that the ratios are too high and the investments are a little risky, if not a lot risky. So investors have either been forced into equities seeking yield or fooled into equities, believing that U.S. companies are doing well. As rates have been held artificially low for almost a decade in the U.S., the search for yield has rotated 
large amounts of funds out of bonds and into equities. Additionally, low-cost debt has allowed many companies to borrow money to buy back stock instead of investing in plant property and equipment to achieve true earnings growth through real economic production. Q real economic production. Not buying back stock to funnel earnings growth. The move to buy earnings carries no real production value and is unsustainable for the medium term and for the long term earnings growth. In addition to debasing their earnings, the price to earnings ratios have inflated to extreme levels that I find completely unjustifiable and frankly risky to be invested in. Investors have been ignoring the underlying fundamentals driving this economy and these stocks. Equities are in a bubble and once an event occurs to turn the exuberant to turn the exuberance around, uh, expect equities to fall in line with historical more rational valuations, just as you saw with the 27 market crash, just as you saw with the dot-com market crash and others. When price earnings ratios get this high, when the fundamentals just don't justify the levels we're at, you will see a crash. So this crash could be 15, 20%. That'd be a pullback in my opinion. The crash would be maybe 40% or higher. I think we're probably gonna see something in between there. If we get a 10 or 15% pullback, we go a little higher. 10 or 15% pullback, I mean, at some point it's gonna crash harder, I think. We'll have to see. One other factor that we have to keep in mind is the fact that the US dollar is going to be devaluing. Uh, so, as the U.S. dollar devalues, it's going to push equities higher. So, but we have to take a look at it on a real terms basis, and uh, I think that's how you should take a look at equities. Uh, one way to do that would be looking at the Dow in gold or the Dow in a commodity, um, considering the fact that gold's manipulated. We all know it's manipulated lower right now. Um, that. It's not going to be a good metric to gauge uh, inflation stripped uh, down number down number. So we can take a look the nominal the nominal rate uh, the nominal number is twenty two thousand or it's over twenty two thousand. But what is it really when you factor inflation into the mix? And a lot of the inflation that we see is is manipulated as well. So we need to find. Uh, uh, the, the perfect balance, the perfect mix to really get a, a good picture about where equities really are in comparison to real numbers, not nominal numbers. And that'll give, uh, that'll give us a good picture. So I'll, I'll have more expansion on that in the future in, in future reports and probably in side piece reports as well. But this is overall, this is going to be the end of the report. This is where we are. We have these major trends that I talked about that are going to lead way to a recession coming in the future. And the recession could be a depression. It most likely is going to be more severe than the rest. And so we got to look out for it. Um, we got to prepare for it. I think gold and silver are good ways. Well, while they're manipulated lower, they're on sale. Try to get your hands on some. You can go to sites like uh, JM Bullion, SD Bullion. You can get gold and silver. I would recommend doing that. Uh, and just prepare however you can. Uh, so this is Sal Carapriz signing off.